Welcome to the Capital Forum's Antitrust Interview Series, sponsored by Kroll on Track. My name is Karina Lubell, and I'm delighted to be joined today by John Harkrider, an antitrust partner in the New York office of Axon Veltrop and Harkrider. Today, John and I will be discussing the strategic timing of regulatory filings in international transactions. John, thank you for joining us. Thanks. Um, so given the global nature of business, mm -hmm. it's no surprise that a growing number of transactions are triggering filings in multiple jurisdictions. So perhaps to start, you could walk us through the process of how do you determine where to file? Right. So usually there are two separate lists of jurisdictions, um, maybe even three. Uh, there are the jurisdictions where um, you have to file mandatory filings. Um, there are the jurisdictions where it's a mandatory filing and it's a suspensory jurisdiction which means that um, if you don't get clearance, you can't close. And then there are those jurisdictions where um, it may be advisable to file, uh, not required. And um, maybe even fourth, there are those jurisdictions where um, you have post-close filings. And so you need to look at all of those issues. Um, this all ties back into the contract and um, whether and which jurisdictions are going to be closing conditions and whether you're the buyer and whether you're the seller. So for instance, um, let's say you have a voluntary jurisdiction um, and uh, there is a risk of an investigation. Uh, if you choose not to file uh, and then you close and then the agency afterwards comes after you, uh, as a buyer, that's a horrible result. As a seller, that's fine. You don't care. You got your money. So all of those considerations need to come into play. So you need to figure out you know, which bucket each of these jurisdictions go into then you need to draft the contract. And so it's really at that time, um, you know, once you've decided who the buyer or seller is going to be, depending upon what side of the transaction, and you're trying to figure out what the risks are going to be, what the timing risks are going to be, what the closing risks are going to be. So it sounds like there is actually a negotiation with respect to even those filings, perhaps the voluntary filings, yes. uh, between the buyer and the seller. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And so, you know, as a buyer, what you want to do is uh, you want to have uh, closing conditions that protect you against antitrust risk, uh, and you also want to have control over strategy. Uh, so there may be those jurisdictions that um, are voluntary jurisdictions or even mandatory jurisdictions where you say, you know what, I'm not going to file there. Um, the because the risk is too high and I don't think that that jurisdiction's ever coming after me. Uh, they've never come after anybody in the past. So okay. it's, a, it's a pretty complex analysis, but you have to do it as early as possible because all of these issues play into the level of antitrust risk and the level of timing risk. Sure. And so once you've identified or you've decided on the jurisdictions mm -hmm. in which you're going to file, um, how do you figure out when to file? I mean, is, is the idea to have uh, get clearance in each jurisdiction simultaneously? Yeah, so it really depends upon what, your, what type of deal it is. So a lot of the deals we do are really tough deals, um, and this is a very difficult regulatory environment. Um, so uh, you, I would say there are two general big strategic decisions you need to make. So one decision you need to make, and we did this in uh, Dell EMC, um, is you need to make the decision um, uh, do you want to get clearance uh, by the major jurisdictions, um, let's say the United States and Europe, um, so that you can and get that phase one clearance, so avoid a second request, avoid a phase two in Europe, and get that clearance um, in such a way that you can send a signal to the other agencies, you can get a decision and you can say, well, here's the EEC decision to you know, a various, you know, whatever jurisdiction you're going to. You know, they didn't see that there was a problem. You shouldn't see that there was a problem. So in Dell EMC, we actually delayed the HSR by four months um, because we wanted to have uh, a complete uh, investigation by the agency and avoid a second request. So we tried to answer all of their questions prior to filing the HSR so that you never got a second request. So we didn't get a second request in the United States, we didn't go to phase two in Europe, and then we were able to go to other jurisdictions and say, hey, um, look, they didn't think that there was a problem, um, and it's been a successful strategy. Okay. It sounds like from what you were saying before that um, you do think that the, uh, the, the result or the decision mm -hmm. in one jurisdiction could have an impact oh, sure. on another. Um, to what extent have you seen coordination uh, among re regulatory authorities in different jurisdictions? There's a massive coordination. Um, so we always see coordination, or almost always. Um, I've actually had instances where, uh, where Europe and the United States have not coordinated, but in almost all cases, the United States and Europe coordinate. Um, 
uh, every other jurisdiction can be a little bit different. The PACs can be a little bit different. Um, but people like to learn as much as they can, and they like to uh, capitalize upon the wisdom of other, of other regulators. And so there is uh, universal coordination. And I would say you know, Thermo Fisher Life is a good example of that, um, where I think the regulators throughout the world, including in China, um, did a really masterful job of ensuring you had consistent global remedies. Um, and uh, frankly, in Dell EMC, we needed to have we needed to have everyone sort of sign off on the strategy. We needed to talk to Europe. We needed to talk to the United States, um, so that they actually knew what we were doing. And the idea was that we didn't want uh, the United States to put us into a second request, um, but we also uh, didn't want to put the EC in a position where they needed. Uh, to make a decision uh, before they were ready to make a decision. And so we wanted to make sure that there was complete coordination on timing as well. So you really need to game plan this out. I mean, deals, especially the sorts of deals that we do, are very, very difficult deals. Um, you know, if you have a deal that has, you know, a 50% chance of success or maybe even less, uh, every single percentage is going to matter. And so you need to game this out and you need to game out strategy very, very specifically. And sometimes as a buyer, what that means is that you need to have control over strategy because a seller will not necessarily have that same viewpoint as how to approach this. And you can't be in a situation where uh, you can't make decisions because you can't get a sign off from the seller. Sure. And does it, it, it seems that, I mean, since, since you're talking about the um, cooperation among the agencies uh, in, in various jurisdictions, that they uh, sometimes require confidentiality waivers. Sure. Um, and particularly what you just mentioned about the buyer and the seller might have different motivations mm -hmm. for um, working with them. Do, are, have there ever been any instances when um, you have uh, refused a confidentiality yes. waiver? It, how does that arise? Um, so one place it can come it can come up is in the context of privilege. Um, so Europe and the United States have different privilege rules, uh, especially with respect to communications uh, with in-house counsel. Um, and if you sign a waiver, uh, you may end up uh, you know confidentiality waiver. You may end up uh, waiving privilege as well. Um, and so you need to be very very careful about this. This comes up a lot in transactions involving patents, where almost all the strategic documents are actually written by lawyers. And there's a uh, you know there's a fine line between whether these are documents that are you know legal analysis or whether they're business analysis with respect to legal rights, you know, with respect mm -hmm. to a patent. So um, you know we've done a lot of the work around uh, you know mergers involving uh, standard essential patents, and in those issues you may not necessarily want to give waivers. Is there ever a concern that if you withhold a waiver um, that you're sort of uh, showing, I don't know, I don't want to say your guilt, but um, the, that you're acting uncooperative and that that might not work out in your favor? So um, my general view on those subjects is that if you explain to a regulator why you're doing something um, and are transparent, um, they'll be fine with it. They may not like what you're doing. I think where people get into trouble is where they're underhanded about things. Um, and they're not transparent. Um, you know, we've always, this comes up in lots of instances where people say, oh, you can't comply, you can't comply. The agency will take it as a declaration of war. I think that's a very inside uh, Washington viewpoint. Um, and, you know, sort of our, <laughs> our, I think, entire reputation as a firm is actually based on uh, two different approaches. It's the approach of being very fair, very transparent, very upfront with the government, but also uh, being willing, and I think this is almost uh, uh, a cardinal fact of, uh, of living in a free society, if you have rights, um, you should be able to exercise them. And rights and laws have no meaning if you're not allowed to follow them. So I've had situations where the agency has asked for a notice to close, and I don't have an obligation to give notice to close because it's not a HSR reportable deal. Um, I will tell them that I won't give them notice to close. And I don't feel that there are consequences from that. I think the consequence comes from not being fair and transparent with the agency. It seems like that might work in uh, with some agencies mm -hmm. um, more effectively than sure. others. Mm -hmm. And, and actually, since we're, we're comparing agencies here, maybe you can talk a little bit about, um, I, I'm, I'm obviously most familiar with the U.S., mm -hmm. but um, other jurisdictions in which antitrust is not the only consideration sure. uh, in, in a deal, does that have an impact on 
um, both how you time a filing mm -hmm. and how you work with that agency? Well, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that, um, that if you want people to act a certain way towards you, that you should act that way towards them. Um, so I think Mofcom is a good example of this. Um, so a lot of times there are people out there who are fearful of how Mofcom is going to do an analysis because they're concerned about the industrial interests uh, that Mofcom will take into account. You know, my view is that if I treat them with respect, with the same way that I would treat the EC, with the same way that I would treat the U.S., uh, that we have a higher probability of, of, of them doing, you know, a thorough, complete, and comprehensive analysis. Um, and in my experience, um, you know, the, the, the quality of the work that they do and the considerations that they take into account are not materially different um, than, uh, than the United States. So in Thermo Fisher Life, we not only got a completely consistent remedy, but they cleared the transaction faster than the FTC cleared the transaction. Um, and that's because, um, you know, we told them that, uh, you know, we, we, we thought um, that they were under unfair criticism. Um, from not being as fast and not being as thorough, and maybe the best way to dispel that notion would be very fast and very thorough, and that's exactly what they did. So um, I just think if you treat somebody um, as if they're at cross purposes with you, they're going to be at cross purposes with you. Sure. Um, so we talked a lot about the, mm -hmm. the U.S., yeah. Europe, uh, China. Mm -hmm. uh, are there other jurisdictions um, that you sort of grant special consideration when you're making decisions both about timing and sort of how yeah. to work with the, the agency? Yeah, so, um, you know, certainly all the other Asian jurisdictions, um, you know, or major jurisdictions, whether that's, uh, you know, the KFTC, the TTFC, uh, you know, the JFTC, you know, all the, all the Asian agencies, um, obviously Brazil, um, you know, uh, KJ does a you know, very good job, a very thorough job, um, and yeah, certainly Canada. So, uh, you know, the, the, the major, the major jurisdictions, um, you know, we've we've been lucky to get uh, you know consistent and thorough results um, in jurisdictions. I can't think of that many examples where we've actually had inconsistent remedies. What's the largest number of filings you've ever had to do for a particular transaction? Uh, Thirty-five. Wow. And how long? Do you mind my asking how long that uh, that transaction took to get clearance uh, uh, or eight, to close? Uh, eight months. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. So. Um, well, John, I think that we are about out of time, okay. um, but I appreciate you joining us here sure. today for our discussion on yeah. the strategic timing of international transactions. Awesome. Great. Well, so, it's very good to thank, talk to you. Thank Thanks. you.